Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Sarah. I don't want to say it's officially autumn because I don't think it is, but autumn has definitely arrived in Scotland. We have the most perfect autumnal day today. It's beautiful blue skies, it's sunny, it's very windy and cold, but it's just, it's given me a new lease of life. Just like looking out of um, my window, I can see like beautiful leaves starting to turn and this is just oh, it's my favorite time of year like it is for most people and most you i think but um yeah i'm so excited and today i thought i'd film a reading wrap up for july and august it's not all the books i read in july and august um but specifically from the hurt kid read readathon this is the hardest reading challenge you'll ever do hosted by quirky i'll leave all the uh, information in the description and yeah, it's a really hard reading challenge. I'm borderline delusional about my reading capabilities. And I thought I'd just wrap up probably bi-monthly, which I think means every two months rather than twice a month. But I don't know, I'm taking it to mean every two months or so, um, just to sort of talk about the books that I've been reading. Um, how well I'm doing with each of the um, prompts within the challenge. There's a bingo board and you have to tick off all of the prompts and for most you can't double up but for some you can and uh, those double ups have saved me um, for the last two months because I have only read nine books for this challenge which doesn't bode well. Um, it's a year-long readathon so I have until July next year um, but yeah it's, it's not going the best <laughs> but yeah um i'll just take you through um some of the books i've read and let you know about my progress for each of the prompts there's no particular order to the books i've read i just thought i'd write them down um sort of from the sheet and it's just like this is the order that they arrived in um it's not the order i read them or anything like that and the first one is queen bee by juno dawson this is a prequel of sorts to her majesty's royal coven um, which is a really really good fantasy series. I'm so excited for the third book. I was very salty that this book came out before we have the final, I think the final instalment um, in that series because I just want to know what's happening in the original series. I don't really care about the prequels and that's ultimately kind of how I felt about the book. I mean I was excited to read it um, I read it pretty much as soon as it came out, it's very short and I listened to it on audio. Um, this follows a woman called Grace and she's in a, a loveless marriage and moves to London to be I think a lady in waiting, I don't understand all the core terms um, but she's like involved in the court um, of, of Henry VIII and she sort of becomes involved with Anne Boleyn who then goes on to become the wife of Henry VIII and is beheaded by him and in this book Anne Boleyn is a witch and so is Grace and they have kind of a, a sapphic relationship that forms um, and it's really just about Grace trying to find out who it was who betrayed Anne Boleyn, she's beheaded for being a witch um, and she's trying to find out who betrayed her it was one of um the other witches and it's just like when she finds out who it was who's betrayed her she's sort of like hell-bent on revenge and like going after her essentially um we flip quite a lot throughout so it was like when grace first arrives in london um and like as her relationship prog progresses with anne and i didn't really like the way it just like flitted about a lot i found it quite hard to follow um there wasn't enough distinction for me in the characters they're all called like lady margaret and stuff and it's just like i like a lot of the time i was just like i don't know who you are um there's just nothing really to distinguish you from any of the other women in in this like court slash coven um because most of the court um is made up of um witches as well um the only character i really liked in this is cecilia um i thought she was like if not likeable she was at least um interesting and like I just wanted to find out more about her I didn't really like Grace or Anne um in fact I, I disliked Anne which is fine um I can cope with disliking uh, a protagonist that's not a problem but I just didn't find her 
sort of interesting enough to to root for or care about um and grace was a bit flat for me as well um i thought the writing was was good um nothing amazing um the plot just didn't work for me at all it was just very slow until it wasn't and yeah I, I, I think possibly the issue with this for me is that if this wasn't part of the series I would not have picked this up because it's not the kind of thing that I like to read like historical fiction set in that period isn't really for me I thought maybe I'd like it more because it's got that like fantasy lilt to it but it's very low fantasy so um yeah it just wasn't really for me and I will definitely continue with the series and um, following sort of like the main storyline and the characters in the present day but yeah I just didn't didn't really care for this one at all unfortunately a new release that I did really care for is A Sorceress Comes to Call by T Kingfisher I have read a T Kingfisher book in the past and DNF'd it I think it was The Hollow Places I just couldn't get on board with it and I'm feeling similar I've just started listening to the audio of Nettle and Bone and again I'm really struggling to get into that but A Sorceress Comes to Call just sort of grabbed me straight away um this is a loose retelling of the goose girl fairy tale which I'm not familiar with and we're following a young girl called Cordelia who lives with her mother in this kind of um impoverished village I suppose um they're not like in poverty they're just like poor people you know like peasants um she lives with her mum and her mum is very um controlling of her and puts her into um what she calls an obedience um so if cordelia does something that her mother evangeline doesn't want her to do or doesn't approve of she will just like curse her essentially and take over her actions and make her do and say things um that, that she wants her to do and um, so her mother is a sorceress and Cordelia is kind of living this um, miserable life where she's outcasted from the rest of the town both sort of by her peers for, because she's a bit unusual like the family is a bit unusual um, it's just her and her mother which is kind of frowned upon because she doesn't know who her, her dad is um, and she's kind of ostracized by her mother as well because her mum doesn't want her getting too involved with the outside world she basically lets her go to school and run errands and that's it um, there's no real place for for friends for Cordelia um, apart from her mother's horse Falada who um, she has sort of like this affinity and, and kinship with. And one day Cordelia's mother tells Cordelia that they need to leave immediately um, and they're going to live with this squire and she's going to try and get him to marry her. Her ultimate goal is to become very rich and she wants to marry into a good family so that she can then marry Cordelia off into um even more riches so she sort of happens upon this squire and just like I can easily manipulate him he will fall in love with me um and everything will be fine um but there's something a bit sinister about the way she's um going about this um she tells Cordelia they have to leave quite quickly and the cart that they leave in is stolen um from one of the men in the village and we find out quite quickly that Evangeline has done something pretty terrible to this guy and they're essentially fleeing from the scene so they arrive at this um manor house essentially um with the squire and his sister lady hester and they sort of set about trying to um, become a part of this family Lady Hester is immediately suspicious of Evangeline, calls her doom and is also suspicious of Cordelia as well because she doesn't realise that Cordelia doesn't necessarily agree with her mother and get on with her mother and Cordelia really just wants like a life where she's just left alone and um, sort of not under the, the clutches of her mother. She's got no interest in like wealth and marriage and, and things like that. She just wants to enjoy her life. And this is another one where there's not a huge amount of plot until the end um it's just very dark and kind of gothic i suppose i'm um, following cordelia as she sort of gradually becomes friends with um lady hester and they kind of form a, a bond and sort of vow to 
try and stop Evangeline from, from marrying into the family because Lady Hester is very suspicious of her and knows that her intentions are not good. I really love the character dynamics. Um, Lady Hester has a, a group of friends who are all menopausal women who all come to stay with her and they're just so funny and their friendship is really pure and wholesome and you just really found yourself rooting for them and the way they sort of take Cordelia under their wing is just like such a nice it's really cosy in a book that isn't necessarily cosy in itself. Um, I thought Evangeline was the perfect villain. Um, she was really scary and um, yeah, I just really loved her character. Loved the character of Falada. Just like amazing, terrifying. Um, yeah, he's he was really good too. Um, and yeah, I just I had such a good time reading this. I listened to it on audio, really enjoyed the audio. Um, and I just raced through it and it's been a long time since I enjoyed a book as much as that one. Um, it wasn't necessarily like the best book that I've ever read. I thought the writing was really good um, and like I said the characters were really good. The plot was like fine I think. Um, I think the plot was like my least favourite part of, of the whole thing. I was really just enjoying reading about um, the characters mostly but yeah I just guess I need to read more fairy tale retellings because this is easily one of the best books that I've read this year. I read My Husband by Maud Ventura and this is translated from French by somebody whose name I can't remember so I will link it down below. Um, this is a literary thriller about a woman who um, is obsessed with her husband and completely infatuated by him in a way that is very toxic and unhealthy. Um, she has uh, lots of affairs and really doubts whether her husband loves her and goes to kind of like extreme lengths to try and prove to herself that that he does love her but also like to try and prove that he doesn't um it's just a very unhinged relationship and it's um a kind of sinister exploration of a very toxic relationship. I thought this was fine, um, I don't really have any lasting impressions. I, I read this in July and I, I can't really remember a whole lot about it other than what sticks to me is that it just felt very heterosexual and I remember reading the ending and being like kind of like oh wow what a good ending that was great wasn't expecting that and then just thinking about it and just being like actually that ending was kind of shit um so yeah I just I thought it was fine um like I said it, it's not gonna um stick with me really I read The Psychopath Test by John Ronson and I actually ended up quite enjoying this I was contemplating DNFing it because at the start I couldn't see really where it was going this is a non-fiction and we open the book with John Ronson being recruited by a woman who becomes part of um a riddle essentially like her and a lot of her peers are sent um copies of a book and it appears to be like a riddle that they have to decipher and they have no idea who sent it and they kind of enlist John Ronson to help them figure out who it was who, who sent it to them and, and to help them sort of um, solve this riddle um, and eventually they, they do that and they find the guy who was responsible for, for sending all this stuff under like a, a false name and it's just like a very elaborate hoax essentially and he's speaking to somebody about it who says Oh, this isn't a clever stunt um it's not a work of genius it's the work of a psychopath and that gets john ronson thinking what what is a psychopath and he kind of falls down a rabbit hole from there really he delves into um the diagnosis for a psychopath which is made using something called the bob hair checklist and basically this guy called bob hair has created a, a checklist of all these different characteristics in a person and if all of these criteria are met then they can be diagnosed as a psychopath and John Ronson talks to lots of different people he talks to somebody who is um, a current prisoner serving time who has been deemed a psychopath and is trying to prove that that he isn't one he explores sort of how flawed the test is because he's just like oh well you could definitely sort of apply that to like CEOs of like 
big sort of multi-billion dollar um, company you could apply it to to people who go on to reality tv so he specifically talks about like the, the jeremy kyle show which existed in the uk um a few years ago um another just reality tv contestant there's a section about l ron hubbard where he's talking about people who sort of were close to him and um discussing whether he could be deemed a psychopath I think more than being a book about psychopathy it's just like a, a selection of like interviews with some sort of vaguely interesting people um it doesn't really come to to any conclusions which is fine um it's just you know really talking about like how we determine what a psychopath is and sort of what merit this test has the, the flaws that it has like how far could we interpret the test to like sort of diagnose ourselves as psychopaths um it was quite interesting. Um, I think I liked listening to John Ronson more than I enjoyed sort of the subject matter. He was really funny and deadpan. I just thought this is a great listen on audio. Um, and I could, yeah, I could just listen to him like talk about anything, I think. Um, I didn't necessarily need to be interested in, in what he was saying. Um, there was a bit towards the end about, um, it's talking about how some people see that bipolar disorder is being overdiagnosed in children and it it kind of didn't sit particularly well with me um i didn't really enjoy where that went it didn't it didn't present sort of any conclusion and john ronson didn't say this is what i think but i think the discussions in it were kind of a little bit maybe biased towards the people who think that this is a condition that is overdiagnosed um and the same with autism as well um it just was a bit like didn't really like where it was going but that was a very small part of the book and, and otherwise um yeah i enjoyed it and i would recommend it i read you let me in by camilla bruce and this was a bit of a disappointing read to me I thought I'd really enjoy this. I was thinking it would be a bit like um, Pine by Francine Toon, which I really enjoyed, and it it wasn't really like that. I would say this is a cross between Max Porter's Lanny and basically anything that CJ Cook has written. I think you'll probably get on with the writing style if you like CJ Cook. Um, I did enjoy the writing to a point, um, there was just a lot of dialogue in this book and I hated the way the dialogue was written. Um, so we're following a woman called Cassandra and Cassandra is in her 60s, I think, and she is a prolific romance author who has a very controversial past. And she leaves a letter to her niece and nephew. She's been missing for a year and says, once I've been missing for a year, you can open this letter and you'll get your inheritance from me and you will also have sort of my version of what happened in my life and from my perspective. And Cassandra, uh, in her earlier life, was accused of murdering her husband, but the case against her kind of fell through, but everyone sort of basically still believes that she did it and she's basically documenting all the events up until um, the the death, the, the murder of this person and being like, this is my version of events, this is what happened. And it definitely has a kind of magical realism undertone to it. Um, Cassandra suffers from abuse as a child. And while this abuse occurs and sort of throughout her life after, she's visited by a figure called the Pepper Man, um, who is not a very nice figure and kind of gets her to do things that maybe she doesn't want to do. We're never really sure if he's real or not um, or if he's just a sort of manifestation of the trauma that she has experienced and Cassandra herself says well why can't it be both? Why can't he be a manifestation of my trauma but also actually exist? Um, so she's a very unreliable narrator because a lot of her version of events includes um, the Pepper Man and this like sort of cast of like woodland creatures essentially um, who feature very heavily in her life and there are a lot of 
gaps and you know things missing and things that don't really make sense and it's an exploration of, of trauma more than anything I would say um and I when I first started reading it I was just like oh I'm not really sure I like this um I'm not massively into it and then I got really into it and was just like okay yeah I'm really enjoying this and it, it's not plot heavy at all but the atmosphere was really there for me and I was just like intrigued to find out what happened but once it got to about I'd say the the final third I just it, it kind of lost me and like I said that the dialogue the way it was written it was a lot of it was like um conversations between Cassandra and the Pepper Man which would mostly follow the same kind of structure which was oh and I said this and then the Pepper Man said this and then I said this and then the Pepper Man said this and I just couldn't get on board with that at all um I just really didn't enjoy reading it and I thought the ending was kind of a letdown from what I remember it was fine but again I don't think it will stick with me and definitely not one of my favourites I also read The Raven Boys by Maggie Stiefvater and this is a YA fantasy which is something that I wouldn't normally go for. The thing that drew me to this was that it heavily features um, Welsh mythology and um, I enjoyed the book. Um, we're following a character called Blue who is a teenage girl. She lives with her mother and just like a whole host of other women in this house and they work as clairvoyants um, but Blue doesn't have the same um, gift of clairvoyancy that um, the rest of her family do but she works basically as like an amplifier so when she is in the room um, with her mother or any of the other clairvoyants like the things that they can see are much stronger um, and much more vivid and so her mother takes Blue to um, they have like a, a yearly I think gathering at this um, cemetery and speak to souls of the dead and Blue goes um, with her mother because she thinks she'll be able to amplify these voices of the dead but this time Blue goes and she she hears a voice for herself and it's a, a boy called Gansey that she hears and when she sees this boy she knows that he will die within 12 months and it sort of transpires that um, Blue has a, a curse upon her where the the kind of if she kisses somebody who she is truly in love with then they will die and so she sees this guy called Gansey and she's like oh he is one of the raven boys and they all go to this kind of elite um private school and Blue's just like I want nothing to do with them they're all horrible people um and they're not like the kind of people I want to get involved with I just will avoid them at all costs and she kind of becomes embroiled with with Gansey and his um friendship group from there um yeah I I enjoyed it and the where the Welsh mythology comes into it is Gansey is basically trying to find and reawaken Owain Glyndwr who is a Welsh um figure of, of rebellion against the English kind of like um Robert the Bruce um, of Scotland, um, like that, that kind of thing. Um, and that's where this really fell down for me. This is just the first book in a series and it's kind of a book where nothing massively happens. It's just kind of really building the world and, and the plot and we're just like laying the foundations of things that are to come in later books. So I don't have a huge amount to say on like the actual plot um as such but one thing that really really bothered me is that this is really grounded in Welsh mythology and the, this figure of Owen Glendour and they call him Owen Glendour throughout the book and like spell his name in the anglicized way and it just felt so like offensive I suppose like why are you writing about this this culture and this this figure and using the anglicized version of his name like when he was rebelling against english oppression in wales and, and failed and, like, and even now wales is still suffering from the impact of centuries of um colonization under english rule and just um you know like we've lost a lot of our culture we've lost a lot of our language 
um, in just really brutal and violent ways and it just felt to me like why would you do that? I just think when you're writing about uh, a figure who is so important to like Welsh liberation and Welsh freedom and it's so representative of like Welsh culture and Welsh language like why are you anglicising it? It just really didn't sit right with me and I didn't like that at all but otherwise like the plot and the characters like enjoyed it and will probably continue with the series. And finally I read A Magical Girl Retires, I read Holiday Heart and I read Fauna and I'm not going to talk about those two books here because the video is quite long anyway and um, I spoke about all of those in a Women in Translation reading vlog which I will link down below. So now that I've yapped about all the books let's talk about the, the challenges and how I've done. I'm sort of going to go through each challenge I think and let you know sort of what progress I've made um, which probably isn't very much. I'm just going to keep looking at my laptop to go through. So the first challenge is read a 500 plus page book in one day. I have not done that and I'm going to find that extremely difficult to do. Um, the next one is the A to Z challenge and this one is one of the powerful prompts and you can um, double up so you can use like multiple books for multiple different purple prompts. There's like white prompts and purple prompts. Um, the white prompts you can't double up on. Um, so the A to Z challenge is you can pick whether you do like titles of books or like author names but you just have to read basically the whole alphabet. So I have read for B, Camilla Bruce, D, Juno Dawson, G, Holiday Heart, K, A Sorceress Comes to Call, P, A Magical Girl Retires, R, The Psychopath Test, S, The Raven Boys and V, My Husband. Um, so that is 8 out of 26 of the prompts and 31% of this prompt done. Um, I think this is the one I will probably find the easiest um, just because I don't really need to, to plan for it. I like, will probably hit most of the alphabet just in what I read in general. Um, and we have three or more blurbs on a book so you basically have to read a book that has um, at least three blurbs on the back and then read three of those authors as well. Haven't done any of that yet. Um, read three books that you bought at a garage sale. Haven't done that. Um, read five author tuber books. Haven't done that. Read a four plus book series. Um, maybe The Raven Boys um, but I, I don't know how soon I want to continue with that series so I'm not sure if I've left it blank for now. Um, five books from five small booktubers so like recommendations from five small booktubers. I haven't done that. I'll probably just make an entire video doing that one. We have five books from other countries or like authors from other countries that aren't um, the UK, the US and Canada. Um, I'm going, I think in the actual prompt you can do like they're set in different countries. I'm going to do like they're from other countries. So like from, from authors who aren't American, Canadian or British but set in somewhere other than those places as well. So um, my husband is um, set in France and by a French author and A Magical Girl Retires is um, Korean and set in South Korea. So I've done two of those five prompts which is 40% of that challenge. Then we have the Queer Rainbow Challenge and um, I so far haven't done any of that. Um, I think technically I could class Queen B in that but um, because it's like the, the prompts are lesbian, gay, trans, bi or pan, questioning, intersex and asexual, like Queen B is sapphic but is it necessarily lesbian? I'm not sure. Um, it, it could I guess fall under the category of questioning. Um, but yeah, I'll see. I'll maybe use it for, for one of those, um, but I think I would prefer to read something that for questioning that is like kind of about the, the questioning process rather than just like, oh, well, technically she was questioning because she didn't know that she was into women before she met Anne Boleyn. And I think for lesbian, I would want to read something where it's just like explicitly a lesbian relationship rather than just a, a sapphic relationship um, because being sapphic doesn't necessarily mean that you're a lesbian so um yeah I need to have a think about that one. 
then we have a book direct from an indie author haven't done that one yet and a local author a bookstore purchase haven't done that then we go on to spell your full name and I don't want to tell you what my full name is so I've decided to use my channel name which is Sarah Reed Slowly which coincidentally has the same number of letters as my actual full name so I think that's okay um so for S I've read A Sorceress Comes a Call nothing for A R I've read The Raven Boys again nothing for A H Holiday Heart nothing for R nothing for E nothing for A nothing for D uh, nothing for S, nothing for S, nothing for L, nothing for O, nothing for W, nothing for L, and for Y, you let me in. Um, so I have read four of the 16 of those prompts, which is 25%. Now, I feel like I should have read more, like I, I could have got more out of that. Um, five um, Spiffbo non-finalists haven't done that, a completed webcomic haven't done that. Um, a new release read in the month it was released. I have done this because I have to keep on top of this. I have no other option. So basically when a book comes out in like July, you have to read it in July. Um, and yeah, there's no room for slacking because the months are moving on. Um, and we need to do this for every month of the year. So for July, I read Queen Bee, which came out in July and August, A Sorceress Comes to Call, which came out in August, unsurprisingly. The next prompt is a top 10 book in the year that you were born. I was born in 1990 and I have not read anything so far um, that was a top 10 in 1990, so not done that one. Um, finished three books in 24 hours, haven't done that one. Um, a recipe from a book that isn't a recipe book um, and cook a dish from it, haven't done that one. Um, the genre challenge, um, this is another purple prompt um, where we have... Um, fantasy i've read queen bee sci-fi i haven't read mystery thriller haven't read um horror fauna um romance i haven't read historical i haven't read. i mean you could class queen bee but i don't, I don't really want to like i don't know if you can use the same book for multiple like prompts across the same like row of the bingo board if that makes sense um i haven't read any historical fiction otherwise um, non-fiction the psychopath test and literary fiction my husband so that is five of eight prompts and 63 percent of that um, a crowdfunded book haven't read any um, the rainbow challenge um, this is basically the covers of book you have to read a, a rainbow of, of different um, book covers essentially um, haven't read any red books Orange is my husband, yellow, haven't read yet, green, fauna, blue, holiday heart, purple, haven't read, white, you let me in, um, black, queen bee, and haven't read a brown yet. So that's five of ten of those prompts, so 50%. I think that's one I've done best in. No, no, genre I've done best in, but um, yeah, close, close behind with that one. That's a, another one that should be fairly easy. Um, a classic and its adaptation, haven't done that one. Um, three protagonist names of people you know um, so I have read um, Fauna and that has a character in it called Laura and I have a friend in real life who is a Laura so I'm counting that one um, and that's one of three so 33% of that prompt done and then finally a book for every season um, so obviously I could only do summer up until now um, and I read Holiday Heart for summer so um yeah, that's the book I'll be using. One of four, 25% done, and I'm on track with that one. Um, so yeah, like you can see, I've used a lot of um, doubling up. I think I'm going to get to a point where I'm not able to do that very much as um, the challenge goes on. So basically, you can only double up on purple prompts. So I could use, say, like my husband, I could use it for every single purple prompt, but only one of the white squares, and most of the board is, is white squares. So I'm going to run out pretty soon of um, books I can double up on so it's going to get a lot harder from there but yeah that's how I'm doing in the challenge um pretty poorly am I on track to succeed absolutely not but I'm enjoying it anyway um thank you very much for watching if you're taking part in her kid leave um some of your videos down below or just let me know what you've been reading um if you want to leave a comment but you don't know what to say you could leave 
an emoji let's have um the autumn leaf emoji because it's such a lovely autumn day and i will catch you in another video soon bye <laughs>